Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the workshop on writing for top tie journals, how to impress editors and increase your chance. Proudly presented by the 9th World Conference on Media and Mass Communication 2024. We know that most of you are very keen on knowing more about research and specifically publication where you bring the impact of your work to the world. The main objective of this workshop is to cater your publication needs, and this will be initiative of many more knowledge sharing opportunities. The workshop speaker for today will be Associate Professor Piotr Suda. Before we move forward in the agenda, I would like to share the program for today's workshop. First, we will have the workshop led by Professor Pio Siuda. Then there will be a Q&A session related to the workshop. And finally, you will have a brief overview about the Medcom 2024 conference. So to introduce the workshop speaker, Associate Professor Pio Siuda. He is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Cultural Studies at the Kazimir Wielki University in Poland. He is a member of the Association of Internet Researchers and Digital Game Research Association. His research interests include internet studies, media studies, game studies, and e-sport, among others. He has been published in reputable journals, including the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication, Game and Culture, the International Journal of Cultural Studies, and Leisure Studies. Additionally, he is an associate editor of Sage Journal of Creative Communication. So today, Professor Suda will conduct a workshop on publication under the title of Writing for Top Tile Journals, How to Impress Editors and Increase Your Chance. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to invite Professor Piotr Siuda to conduct this session. Professor, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this great invitation. And it's a great pleasure to be able to conduct this workshop today uh, to speak to all of you. Uh, we have 55 people um, joining our uh, workshop. I think that uh, there will there are more kind. So, but nevertheless, I will start, of course. And thank you for this great uh, invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm from Poland. From it's it's extremely hard to pronounce if you are not a Polish uh, uh, native speaker. Kazimierz Wielki University in Bydgoszcz, Poland. So. Um, I represent the Faculty of Culture Studies, and uh, as you have mentioned, uh, I have many interests, many research interests, uh, but my experience mostly uh, about writing papers, uh, of course, is also um, stems from, from publishing the papers in reputable journals, but also I'm also an associate editor of Journal of Creative Communications, as was said before. And um, I will give you some information uh, on, on publishing in reputable journals based on this as well. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's extremely hard to, um, to, to just talk how to prepare oneself, uh, how to publish uh, in reputable journals, in top tier, tier journals, uh, just within one hour, because this is a one hour workshop. So I, I will just... Uh, I think that I will just mention some issues that are, I think that they are uh, worth uh, considering. And I think that you should try to uh, to gain some more information on these issues. So I will just introduce some, uh, uh, some, some issues. I think that the first thing is that you have to remember is to prepare yourself accordingly. Uh, if you want to impress the editor and increase your chances uh, when publishing papers, I think it's extremely important to prepare oneself. And by preparing oneself or yourself, I mean planning your writing. Uh, also, using proper style, um, choosing the right venue, the right journal is also extremely important. And I will just uh, uh, introduce this paper, uh, these points uh, in a second, because planning is about the category of of one papers, choosing the paper's type, and all these other issues. 
Now, so using proper style, if you are not a native English speaker, this is extremely important because I'm not an English mm, guy. I'm not uh, American. I'm not British, uh, Australian, and so on. I'm not native English speaker. So it's extremely. it was extremely uh, hard for me to... Um, to present my research uh, properly, so I will. I know I don't know if you are uh, native English speakers, so it's I don't have this knowledge. I don't know who you are, but in case you are not, I think may, you may uh, find this useful. Also, uh, choosing the right venue, the right journals, lots of factors influence this, and I will mention them in a second. Uh, when pl planning your uh, writing, when preparing oneself. First thing is, to, I think that the first thing that is very important, and this is this issue is mentioned in lots of uh, uh, academic writing publications, like books and uh, articles and so on, that you have to decide on the category of your paper. And it's not about, uh, it's not about the problem, the hypothesis, uh, research questions, uh, it's it's not that because of course research questions and uh, hypothesis these all are in the paper, uh, but when preparing or when planning you have to just ask yourself what this paper is about to sort of decide the category, and I have three categories here on the slide. So number one, my research shows which theory is true or at least closer to the truth. Number two, this how it this is how it works. Liver cell process, social or cultural phenomena, cloud formation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Number three, what seems similar is actually different, or vice versa. Example: a dolphin is not a fish. So basically, it's about deciding the the main um, frame here. And of course, this is uh, these three categories I have just read are very very broad. You have to imagine a, the appropriate categories for your own field of study, I think, because of course when I'm into game studies, for example, or communication studies, I, or media studies, I would probably decide on uh, several ca categories that I could introduce. But it's it's only like this, you know, cognitive, uh, how to stimulate your brain to, to do the proper writing, to decide the category, and what is this final message, the take-home message you want to just present. But this is obvious, and I think that uh, when coming to some details, is choosing the type uh, of your paper. Because, of course, when you think about the research paper, you uh, imagine this as a research article, like you are doing uh, an important research. Uh, you are asking some research questions, presenting, maybe doing some uh, experiments and so on. So you present this as an empirical study, as a research article. Of course, uh, there, this is like the obvious type of the pay, uh, academic paper. Of course, there are lots of other um, types of papers, like, for example, literature reviews, brief commentaries, case studies, and the journals inform about these types of papers on their websites. And basically, you can find these uh, types uh, when you read the author guidelines. But be sure to read these guidelines perfectly in details because some of the some of the journals may want some particular types of papers and uh, i could give you many many examples for example the journal i am uh, an associate editor of uh, the journal of creative communications has this very basic uh, division on research article literature review brief commentary and case studies just like on the slides but for example, when you take um, research and politics, this is a journal also uh, um, published by Sage. Uh, if you uh, if you will look at the website, you will find that they have lots of interesting types. So they have this research article, which is kind of the standard research paper, and the journal encourages short articles. This is how they. Uh, propose it only 4,000 words article should normally not exceed 4,000 words but when you uh, skip this uh, research articles uh, information you see that they also uh, want research notes and these should focus on controversy in the literature presenting a new empirical finding or just discuss the policy implications of recently gained insight and so on and the third uh, type they want is replication studies. 
So in case of replication studies, research and publics invites authors to consider submitting a paper that is along the lines of one or more of the following replication types. Theoretical replication, technical replication, and concept replication. And you can read what these are about on the website. So it's basically about impressing the editor that you have chosen the right type of paper for the research you are presenting for, because of course the editors will not waste time if they see that this is not the type of the article they are using in their journals. So I think that uh, it's extremely important to, uh, to uh, familiarize yourself with the types and of course choosing the right type is one of the part, one of the points of preparing oneself. But also using proper style, and I mean here mainly, I mean here mainly language, language, but not only, because lots of scientific writing, and I mean here not only social sciences, I'm into social sciences, I'm media studies, communication studies, but uh, when you look at uh, academic writing publications, books, and so on, you see that the authors suggest not taking like the style of an academic writer, the role of an academic writer is a mistake. And by the by taking on the role of an academic writer, I mean here many, many uh, things. Like, for example, uh, complicating, unnecessary complicating your paper. Uh, I think that this is often a way to hide the mediocrity of one's work. Because if the paper is complicated, for example, when you're considering structure, uh, you are repeating yourself, uh, presenting uh, different parts of the structure in different parts of the paper. This is complicated. Also, uh, complicating the paper is, uh, um, I mean here, the language. If you are introducing a very hard language, and, I'm, uh, and do not get me wrong here, I am uh, talking about uh, a very... Uh, I am talking about science, so this is like complicated stuff. So this is, you know, uh, terminology. This is uh, sometimes very uh, complex themes, complex research questions, and so on. This is obvious, but I mean, when you, we are talking about the language, you have to present it uh, comprehensively. Uh, for example, if you take Nature, this is a journal that is very specific. It's the highest ranked journal in the world, but the language is quite easy there. And of course, you have many, many specialized specialized uh, journals, specialized journals. They use harder language than nature. But the main trend, the main idea is that today you should try to write as to present your research comprehensively, use the uh, lighter language, not do not complicate, not complicating the, the language is also very, uh, it's, it's a good idea. Also, this using proper style is, is just guiding the, the reader, the editor, the reviewers from one topic to another and explaining everything clearly. Uh, I think that it's not wise to leave anything to guess. You, you can, you know, um, use literature. You can reference, uh, uh, you can use references to guide uh, readers, but it's about being very precise. And it's, it's better to be precise and not wordy. If you know what I mean by being wordy in English, this is uh, something you, you, you could try. Of course, do not oversimplify, but explain complex issues clearly. So this is sometimes really hard stuff, but it's very clear. And the main idea is that you should write so the reader never returns to what she has already read. Because, of course, the reviewers, the editors, and of course, your potential readers are very busy uh, person, so they have they don't have time, especially if you are an editor of a top tier journal, uh, Q1, Q2 journal. You have lots of papers coming in, uh, so you have you you are doing this very fast. So you don't if, if something is if, if something is so complicated, you do not want to do this. So it's basically a good idea to be um, uh, to use the, the style I'm I'm proposing, and this is also about the language, of course. And this is one of the reviews I have received when I published in Journal of Computer Mediated Communication. This is a Q1 journal with uh, impact factor 7.4. I think this is one of the um, highest ranked uh, journal in communication studies actually at the moment. And this was a paper I co-authored with, with native English speakers. So this was a guy who 
who checked the language. And nevertheless, one of the reviewers, there were three rounds of reviews. One of the reviewers, uh, there were three, three reviewers there. And one of them stated, uh, this is of course only a short, very, very short part of this review. Uh, one of the remark was the article often uses phrasing that is abstract, obfuscated, or unclear. The whole article needs to be examined for clarity of wording. The writing style is often long and manly. And although I, I believe that I have already learned this, how to use proper English, this was like uh, also, I think that um, uh, there are lots of uh, reasons why this remark was there. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this still surprised me. And it was a proof that, yeah, you should write this in an easier way. But what does this actually mean? Well, for me, I'm a Polish um, English, uh, I'm a Polish, Polish native speaker. So um, I'm guessing that uh, there aren't many Poles here, if there are at all today. But if there are, uh, and if you are not, I will just inform you, the Polish language is really, really specific when it comes to this richness. It, Polish language has lots of adjectives, lots of very, very complicated sentences. Uh, where There are very, very long sentences. So my natural predisposition when writing in English is to, you know, to, is to copy this style, Polish style, and just use it when I'm writing in English. But it, for me, it's not a good idea because this is really awkward language. And this is the language the reviewer here and notice uh, phrasing that is abstract, obfuscated, unclear, and so on. So he wanted it to be more clear. So yeah, this is the idea. So I have used some examples here. Uh, you can see the incorrect style on the left and the correct style um, on the right. So for example, the structures were placed in a vacuum chamber with four optical ports, permitting to measure the spectral characteristic of the transmission of light. This is physics. And maybe it's too complicated. Maybe it's simpler to write to measure the spectral characteristic of the transmitted light. The structures were placed, mounted in a vacuum chamber with four ports. And I'm using this from the Polish language because the left side is just like I would say it in Polish and just translate it. Uh, the obtained results indicate the possibility of applying titanium dioxide layers in these quotings. Maybe it's better to write these or B results indicate or our results indicate or results from this study indicate and so on. Uh, I love this example because this is the example how wordy Polish language used it tends to be. And you should you should avoid being that wordy when you write your research papers. First, so uh, I could write it in my assessment of this issue. I have followed the advice formulated by Stormy King. This researcher proposed that the degree of research subjects privacy infringement online be assessed by and so on. So this long sentence, which is perfectly fine in Polish, would be really awkward in English. So I think that the more appropriate way to write this is I assess this issue following Stormy King who proposed. And the final example here, I don't want to, no, it's not the final, sorry. Uh, it's almost, um, it's, it's a, a one more, two more to go. So for example, incorrect one, the sample of the blocks was not a representative one. So it's when you are re re talking about sampling something in Polish, this is like a, an exact translation, the sample of the blocks. But of course, in English, it's not good. It's, it's incorrect. The blocks sampled were not representative. And the last one, which is a perfect example when I'm talking about Polish language, that this very, very complicated sentence um, on the left, it's perfectly fine in Polish. The main aim of this article is concentrating on factors that are connected with problems of overpopulation and aging in highly developed countries. This tends to be long. This tends to be complicated. It's I think it's it's more lighter to write it uh, like this. The article concentrates on factors related to overpopulation and aging in highly highly developed countries. And of course, it's extremely um, it's extremely hard for me to explain this properly because I could give you more examples and we could discuss the language 
uh, nuances, right? Uh, depending on whether you are uh, native English speakers or not, and what is your native uh, language and so on. But the main idea here is that this paper should be light, comprehensive, clear, transparent, and so on. This is the good way to write a um, research paper. Of course, choosing the right journal is also very important when it comes to impressing the editor, because when the editor will see that the scope of the paper does not fit the scope of the journal, this will be immediately disrejected. Or at least uh, you will have bad luck if the, re the editor will somehow uh, allow for the reviews and then the reviewers will reject the paper based on the scope of the paper, uh, you will lose several months. Um, and you could have easily proposed this paper elsewhere, right? So I think that it's extremely important to um, to to just choose the right journal, to, to understand what is the journal's focus. And I think that it's, of course, about our competences. We read papers, we know journals, so we know which journals are appropriate, I think, but you can use some publisher tools uh, to try to, uh, uh, find some appropriate journals. And each major publisher proposes this kind of tools. For example, Elsevier uh, has this journal finder tool. And this is the tool that will allow you to find some uh, uh, journals. I will use my own abstract here, one of the papers, from one of the papers I have recently proposed. So, uh, I have just copy pasted the abstract here. It's basically all the tools are about this copy pasting or just writing abstracts and maybe keywords, titles, and so on. So I used the abstract of one of my journals and the uh, results are immediately here. Uh, they proposed that the best journal for this um, paper is Computers in Human Behavior, a Q1 journal with impact factor of 9.9. An acceptance rate rate of nine percent, and so on. So you can find other journals here. Some of the matches are quite low, but uh, I think that uh, so that the, the Xavier has this journal finder. Uh, Springer has journal suggester. Uh, Taylor and Francis have uh, uh, journal suggester. Sage uh, is. Um, uh, proposing journal recommender and so on and so on. You can also find some interesting tool in this uh, uh, editage services. Uh, it's it's a journal life. Uh, it called it is called researcher life. Sorry, researcher researcher life. Uh, if you are um, logged in here, uh, you will find a tool that is called journal finder. It's also really really nice. This journal finder. It's similar to. Uh, to El Xavier's journal finder. But uh, these tools, uh, these kind of tools, uh, they are really nice, but the, the truth is that uh, they will only give you some um, uh, some proposals. This, you, sh you shouldn't really treat this as, you know, I will use this journal immediately without thinking. This is not the way. I think this is the way to find some interesting titles, some interesting journals, but it's you have to always consider what is the focus. So you have you have to uh, visit the web page. You have to um, uh, you have to um, write the guidelines. You have to write the articles in this journal. So the competences. Also, of course, um, I think that Increasing your chances is deciding whether your paper is uh, a good fit for the journal when it comes to the metrics. Because sometimes we have this feeling that this paper is really, really good. And I would like to, this research was really good. And I think that uh, uh, we know that this is somehow important and we want to present it to the Q1 journal. But sometimes I think that uh, lots of people are just mm, trying without thinking and they are, you know, try to find the journal with the highest impact factor and so on. I think that uh, you should balance here. Uh, so the metrics are important and the editor and the reviewers, of course, will also um, 
pay attention to the quality of your work. Another uh, important aspect here is deciding on open access. Uh, I don't know if you are, um, if you have money for open access or maybe you just strive for publishing in open access. Of course, this is a good idea. And it's it's not, it, it, basically it has nothing to do with, with impressing the editor, of course. You can you can impress the editor in, in a, and only in such a way that, of course, he will look at your work and will see your work without any barriers, right? If you want to somehow uh, decide uh, about this, uh, there are also some tools that will help you um, uh, uh, gain information on what is the policy of the publisher when it comes to copyrights. And the basic tool, I think, is the Sherpa Romeo. You just use this service, uh, for example, I will use Games and St a Games and Culture Journal. Uh, this is also a Sage Journal. And this is uh, this is full information about what do you have, what is the open access policy. So you have to pay for open access and what, what you can do with the accepted version or submitted version. So the preprint or um, author, uh, the preprint is, of course, the version that the author uh, retains copyright. So you can, for example, publish on your website the, this, this version. Uh, so this is something to be, um, something to use if you want to just quickly find out about the policy of the journal when it comes to the copyrights. There is also directory of, directory of open access journals here. If you want to, find out nice open access journals that are not predatory publishers, that are not predatory journals. Directory of open access journals is a good way to, um, to, to do this. So, of course, watch out for predators, for predatory publishing, for predatory journals. Watch out for questionable journals. Uh, you can use lots of lists, for example, Bales lists, for example, predatory publishing lists. Bales list is, of course, uh, redundant because uh, somehow redundant because uh, it hasn't been it hasn't been updated since 2016. But nevertheless, you can still use it to to try to determine whether the publisher is a predatory publisher. So, of course, Cope is like the comedy of open of publication ethics. If the journal is the member of the Cope, it's is good. You, know, you can uh, be more safe. Uh, watch out, nevertheless, watch out, because lots of questionable journals are not on the list and are members of COPE. And for example, lot, there are lots of discussion when it comes to MDP, MDPI a publisher, whether this is like pirateary publishing or not. And of course, the scientists are disagreeing with each other, whether this is somehow questionable or not. Well, they are questionable because of the speed of the of the reviewing process, but whether these are predators or not, this is being discussed. Uh, and so preparing yourself is about all these issues I have mentioned. So um, if I would do uh, summarize what it means to prepare yourself, you have to decide all these stuff, uh, the category, the journal, the type, uh, uh, and so on. But if you decide the journal, you, you want to submit your article to, then uh, I think it's extremely important if you want to impress the editor and then the reviewers to present yourself appropriately. And I mean here cover letter, uh, following the standards, and uh, of course also later uh, when you receive the reviews responding to all the comments. This is extremely important. So I will start with writing a cover letter. The cover letter, cover letter is, of course, a uh, uh, letter to the editor. Uh, you should explain the scope of your research, the scope of your paper. Uh, and uh, I think the most important issue is to explain that your paper is innovative and why it is innovative. So, of course, because new originality, innovativeness, uh, new, newness of the paper is something that is particularly important for the editors. Uh, the cover letter is also um, a good way to explain all rule breaking. So if you are, for example, exceeding the number of words uh, that is allowed, uh, you can explain the editor why this is taking place and ask him to uh, nevertheless to, um, to include this paper in the process.
uh, yeah, uh, uh, following the standards is preparing a clear and precise abstract, proper title, and crucial keywords. And I will dwell into this in a moment. And responding to the comments is mainly about being very precise and very informative. And I will also mention this in a moment. But first, I have this example of cover letter. I've mentioned why, uh, what, it, what is cover letter and how to um, properly um, present cover letter. So I have this example of a cover letter. I don't want to read it. Um, um, I don't want to. I don't want to read it the whole red letter, but I will just give you some idea how you could uh, 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 structure your cover letter. So first of all, you should explain who you are and what you do. So this is like this uh, cover letter. Dear editor, please find attached the manuscript entitled "Live Driven Soft Robot Mimics Caterpillar Locomotion in Natural Scale." that we would like to submit for publication in Nature Communication as an article. And the findings presented are the results of collaboration between the group and so on. So who they are and what they have done. Then, then there is explaining the aims, challenges, problems, and research questions. Uh, so I won't read it maybe because this is physics, but basically the rule is always the same, that explaining the aims, challenges, problems, research questions, so explaining what has been done and how. And this the third point, explain what is new and innovative. So they have uh, stated in this manuscript, we show that with proper molecular alignment, engineering in a 50 millimeter long stripe made of liquid crystalline elastomer, we can mimic a caterpillar traveling wave of locomotion and demonstrate different walking strategies under laser light illumination and so on. And then there is this, what is new and innovative in this research. And the final, this is something I haven't mentioned before. This is the cover letter, which has this final element of suggesting potential reviewers. This is the last paragraph here. So after this, um, and this asking the, the editor to include this uh, for publication, they uh, have stated, we would like to suggest the following expert scientists for the evaluation of this work. And if you have ever uh, submitted a, a paper to a journal, you know that uh, some journals may have this um, requirement of suggesting uh, the expert scientists for, for, for evaluating the, the work, for evaluating the papers. So suggesting reviewers. However, not all of the journals uh, introduced this. I will use uh, um, an example of uh, cyber psychology, behavior, and social networking journal. This is uh, uh, one of the top uh, tier journals in uh, cyber psychology. I think this is the highest ranked journal in cyber psychology. And currently I have one paper which is under review, uh, but I will not, uh, be, I, will, I won't be talking about this paper. I will just start a new submission, uh, just very, very quickly, and we'll skip all this uh, information, what type of paper this is, and and so on, and I will just go to step five, which are reviewers and editors. And this is the this is the case I have been talking about. So suggesting the reviews. This is not a required field in case of cyber psychology, behavior, and social networking. This is not required. Um, you you can uh, you you can uh, in case of other journals this may be required field, so you are obliged to suggest three, four, or maybe even five reviewers. Mm, but uh, in case, when this is not required, nevertheless, I would still go with this. So I would still try to put here as many names as possible, maybe four, maybe five, maybe three, if you are very, very reluctant or you don't have any ideas, maybe three will, will just suffice. If the given journal has not introduced this field step five in this panel, in this system, I think a good way to introduce, to suggest some potential reviewers is a cover letter. Why this is so important? Of course, 
you are impressing the editor that you know the names from your field. But the main, but it's it's important, of course. But I think the, what is even more important is that the editors are very busy guys. We very be, they are very busy, and it's sometimes it's hard to find reviewer because all the people they know, the names they know, just uh you know reject the appointments. So they don't want they don't have time and so on. So they struggle with finding reviewers with for two or three reviewers. So if you suggest some following expert scientists for them, it's great for them. And even if they don't use the names you have suggested, they will they will be impressed. They will use these names for building their databases of potential reviewers for other papers. This is what I do. Basically I have this files for each topic with the names of reviewers. And if some polite author will send me some names, I look these names, I can see what these people are and just uh, add them to my databases. So I think it's uh, really, really nice to include this. Also, as I mentioned before, Following the standards, it's important to follow the standards. And I mean here, uh, I'm not uh, sure what is your stage of your academic career, whether you are an experienced author, researcher or not, but there are some standards everybody should follow, uh, basically about the title. There are lots of ideas about the title. Do not get me wrong. A lots of ideas because it depends on the discipline, on the field, on the, your individual approach. But the, there are some basic rules, uh, very, very broad rules that the, uh, that the title should reflect the article's content and it should encourage reading the article. This is uh, reflecting the article's content is quite obvious. Encouraging reading the article is more nuanced because uh, it can be understood differently. But whatever the case, please see the titles in a given journal. Usually the journals will not give you exact guidelines about the titles. So you should at least see the titles in a given journal, see what this, what is the style the journal prefers, how the titles look like, and so on. When about when being uh, when uh, when we are talking about reflecting the article's content, it's just being basically being informative. This is all sometimes it's Basically, it's always it, it, it always is one of the uh, criteria of evaluating a paper, whether the title reflects the content. And it's just being informative. I have some examples here, uh, the three titles uh, and two versions of these three titles. So maybe we can look at these. Uh, at the top, you can see acceptance of the limitations resulting from a chronic somatic disease example of uh, uh, it should be like a dash or something, example of people with psoriasis. So this is like a psychology probably, but this title is not that informative. I think it would be more informative if the authors would inform about the results more accurately. So psoriasis as an example, or is an example of high acceptance of the limitations resulting from a chronic somatic disease, an empirical study of psoriasis patients in Poland. The same with the second title, Theoretical Investigation of Titanium Oxide Nanoparticles with Surface Defects. Maybe it would be more uh, appropriate to inform about these uh, more. And that these are not just some broad theoretical investigation, but a concrete result has been given in this paper. So surface defects in titanium oxide nanoparticles strongly affect scattering in ceramic lasers. And the third title, Controversial Amendments in the Revised Code of Criminal Procedure, this is a law. Maybe it's better to present a concrete result, lack of functional value of amendments on relegating court cases to the attorneys in the Revised Code of Criminal Procedure. So it's always about being more informative. So reflecting the content means informing about the result, maybe the methods, uh, maybe a research question, uh, and so on.
And about the title encouraging reading the article. Well, this is more complicated, I think, because uh, uh, I have found some, uh, I think, funny, maybe funny titles. Uh, let's look at these. Guess who is not coming for dinner? Evaluating online reservations for disease surveillance, Journal of Medical Internet Research. You probably think this paper is about you. Narcissist perceptions of their personality and reputation, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Ashes to Ashes, Thermal Contact Burns in Children Caused by Fires, Children and Mini Magnets, An Almost Fatal Attraction, Emergency Medicine Journal, Friends with Benefits on the Positive Consequences of Pet Ownership, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And you can already see what is the encouragement here. So this is this bolder uh, mm, uh, statement that, for example, friends with benefits or guess who is not coming to dinner. This is not informative at all. So this is this part of the title that is supposed to make the title funny, more uh, catchy, more uh, attention grabbing, right? But be aware that this kind of titles are not always appropriate. You have to read the journal uh, you have to read the articles in the journal to decide whether these kind of titles are um, appropriate because sometimes there, are, there aren't this kind of titles in the journal at all. So I think it would be a good idea not to introduce this kind of things then. If the journal, we can see that the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology is about this kind of titles, that is perfectly fine. Uh, this is all one way of encouraging to read the paper because, of course, when I read Friends with Benefits, oh, it's a catchy because I, you know, we know how to understand this. Uh, but it's not about sex; it's about pets. Uh, but uh, this is only one way to encourage um, uh, the potential reader. Uh, I think it's all encouraging to read the article is also about this precise, being precise, being informative. Uh, giving this information about what is the result. This is all connected. So uh, you would impress the editor if you would propose an informative and encouraging title. Mm. But I think even more, more important is the abstract, because this is the first part seen by the reviewer. If the edit and the, and the editor, all, all, of course, is also paying a huge attention to the abstract. Uh, I myself uh, believe that uh, if I see a good abstract, which is well structured, informative, precise, I, I have this impression that maybe the paper is also that good. And if I see abstract, which is obfuscated, unclear, uh, not inform not 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 non informative. I suspect that the paper may be also of a lower quality. But of course, I read the whole um, article to decide its fate. But nevertheless, the abstract is a good way. A good abstract is a good way to impress the editor and the reviewers, of course. Um, so you sh this 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 main idea is that the abstract clearly and accurately describes the content of the article. This is sometimes uh, one of the criteria. I think it's almost always uh, one of the criteria of evaluating a paper uh, by the reviewers. Does the abstract clearly and accurately describe the contents of the article? And uh, well, it's it's complicated <laughs> because of course um, I could give you only some uh, idea about what it means to. Uh, reflect the content of the article. Uh, because, of course, some journals may have different ideas about the abstracts. For example, they use uh, this classical IMART, Introduction Methods Results Discussion, or CRRD. Uh, or they use some other variation of IMART, right? Like we can see here on the slide, for example, Introduction Results Discussion and the methods are the final part of the paper. Or, for example, they uh, use some other variation like results and discussions are connected but um, uh, separated uh, when it comes to different uh, uh, research uh, actions. So uh, it, despite this 
different structure, they, these journalists may have some different idea about the abstract. So they, they may prefer narrative abstract or they may use some different parts in the abstract, not uh, introduction, methods, results, discussion, but for example, they can uh, introduce originality, background, or, 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 or so on. So this universal advice is that you should read the guidelines very, very, mm, in, in, you should read them in details to decide how to construct, how to, how to uh, structure your abstract. But if um, the guidelines does not specify what is the strategy, the main idea is that you should reflect the content, the structure you have used. If they do not give any clues about the abstract, you should just precisely reflect the structure. So if you are using IMRAT, reflect the IMRAT. If you are writing a theoretical paper, literature review, an essay, some kind of humanities essay, uh, uh, there, there always is a structure in your paper and use this structure when writing also the abstract. There are some, there are some uh, mm, very strict ideas how this should be approached. Some authors, some, uh, some uh, editors, some reviewers are very strict about this, and they say that you should just you know, reflect, reflect the proportions from your paper. So, for example, if your abstract is structured in a classical environment, introduction, methods, results, discussion, and you are answering these obvious questions, introduction, what has been studied and why, methods, how did you study, how you have you studied this, this phenomenon, results, what have we found out, discussion, what all this means, that you should, you should reflect the proportions from the paper. So, for example, results are usually the longest part of the paper. So this should also be the longest part of the abstract. So you can see the table with the number of sentences for each part of the abstract. And for example, results should be between three to five sentences. And the introduction, one to three sentences, methods, one to two sentences. This is usually the shortest part. Discussion, one to three sentences. But it depends. Of course, it depends because methods in social sciences, usually this is the shortest part. But in medical sciences, for example, or some other disciplines, some other fields, this could be the longest part. But um, I'm mentioning this because um, uh, to, somehow, to somehow discuss this, to somehow oppose maybe this, because this is a very strict approach. I think that you should be more elastic because uh, of course you should reflect the structure of your paper in the abstract, but nevertheless, sometimes I think it's wise to be more elastic because, for example, despite methods being the shortest part of your paper, maybe this is part that is extremely important, so you would want to have it more emphasized in the abstract to give some uh, idea to the readers, to the reviewer, what has been done. So. And how, how did you approach this, this, this methodology and so on, right? So I think the, being more elastic here is, all, is also a good idea. You can impress the editor using, by using the, the good keywords. Keywords are an extremely important element of your uh, paper because, of course, um, keywords are being indexed by various services, browsers, uh, databases, uh, um, index indexes and so on. Uh, so um, choosing the right keywords is is just making sure. It's it's maybe it's not about impressing the editor because the editor may may be impressed. Oh, what a nice keywords, right? But if the keywords are not that good, but the paper is extremely high quality, they will of course publish. But uh, maybe it's more about uh, reaching. Um, other people, other scientists, because of course, uh, if you use good keywords, you maximize the chances that the people that are interested in this particular topic, in this particular research, will just reach your article, will find you, will find your article. And I think that a good way to decide uh, keywords is this thing I have come up with. <laughs> Uh, I called it the Google Scholar experiment, but it can easily use some other services, some other browsers, 
to uh, verify your keywords. What I mean here is just putting your top three or maybe four or even five uh, keywords into Google Spoiler or some other tool and see what is the topic of the um, papers that we come up. Uh, because if the topic is very similar to your paper, this is this, these are good keywords. Because of course, you should always consider the combine, combine, combining keywords. I've mentioned three keywords because you have to imagine what the people will be um, putting in the Google Scholar, right? Uh, what keywords they will use to find some papers. So um, uh, this is uh, about right combination of, of keywords. And this is also about this balancing between two broad and two general keywords. Because if you use uh, a discipline like social sciences as your keyword, this will be too broad. Because of course this will not, it, your paper will be lost in, in, in all of these papers about, from social sciences. And if you are too precise about your keywords, you will of course, mm, you will of course, uh, uh, no one, no one will be so uh, into this topic that will no one will look for this particular uh, theme. I have a, an example here from my own uh, uh, from my own writing. Uh, I can use it uh, maybe. Uh, it's from the uh, oh I've lost the link, but it's not a problem. I will just. Uh, use uh, uh, Sage Journal here. And yeah, this is one of my papers. And I, I want to show this paper to you and the keywords uh, to um, illustrate the mistakes I have made. So this is the first one. This was the first ever uh, academic paper uh, from indexed in Web of Science that I have in a journal indexed in the Web of Science that I have published. So I was so excited that I finally uh, published in this reputable journal uh, that I forgot about the keywords. Nobody really, really informed me about how to construct, how to uh, phrase good keywords. And um, yeah, this paper has uh, one, two, three, four, five keywords. And out of these five keywords, only one I would agree that it's fine, but other are too, too precise because nobody will look, uh, nobody will put this phrase pop culture in communist Poland as a keyword in a browser or in a safe journal service to search for articles. Only one paper is used to tag this Mm, only one keyword, uh, only only one uh, paper is uh, is tagged by this uh, keyword, and this is the paper I have authored. So these are too too broad, too specific, too precise keywords. And I think you know uh, what I mean, and you have you have um, and some experience yourself. Of course, uh, be aware that uh, the editors. Well, and the reviewers, it's obvious, but the editors, of course, deciding the fate of your paper, whether to des dis reject the paper or not. Of course, they will mm, assess the overall quality of your paper. And I'm not dwelling into this because it's it's always hard part for me to uh, to talk about this because, of course, I don't know your research agenda. I do not know what you study. What is your discipline? What is your research field? So I am unable to give you any particular um, uh, advice on, on this. So I may only uh, present this general points. And um, the idea is that the editors will, of course, uh, assess the structure, whether is this is in line with the um, guidelines uh, and some standards. Uh, they will, and this is very important, judge innovativeness and contributions. They will look at tables and figures and decide whether these are fine or not. They will decide whether references are full and up to date and so on. And 
I think that um, I may I may try to give you maybe some hints from my own experience. One of these hints is that use RMID approach. What does this mean? Well, if you are re re if you are uh, writing a paper and it's structured on this classical IMRT, so introduction methods, uh, results and discussion, this is the way to do it. But when you are writing a paper, switch the order. So use RMID. So results, methods, introduction, discussion. So first create write results, then methods, then introduction, then discussion, and then of course order these parts as they should be in the paper. Why? Because results are the most important. Not not, not the most important, but uh, these are like the they the rule the paper. You 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 mustn't um, introduce any thing that would compromise the results. So everything is uh, in accordance with the results you presented. Methods is just how have you achieved the results? Introduction and discussion. You know these parts. Introducing introdu uh, introducing the uh, the broad field and of course uh, informing about the research questions and so on and discussing the, the paper, the implications. What does this all mean? What are the take home messages? What is the relevance for this broader field of research and so on? And uh, when we look at some other things, maybe I would just tell about the results uh, that scientific writing specialists advise that the results should be like a good story, a story, story leading to several take home messages. And uh, you have to always decide whether all the details are really, really necessary for these take home messages. So it's always about choosing what to include and what is just redundant, non unnecessary. You must focus on these important results that are only important for your story, for these take home messages. And of course, you can use figures, tables, but be sure to avoid common mistakes. And there are lots of common mistakes when it comes to tables and figures. For example, captions should be very informative. Uh, when it comes to this story you are telling, what is the meaning of the table and figure? What is the relevance of the table and figure for this story? You should inform about this in the caption uh, also, of course, the tables and figures tend to be very chaotic, uh, messy. Uh, this should be very precise, transparent, readable. Um, some people, some researchers also uh, repeat what has been presented in the figure and uh, present this uh, data in, in um, main text. This is also a mistake, a very common mistake. Uh, uh, some people, some researchers, uh, use a wrong type of figure for, the, for given data. So for example, uh, rounds uh, versus these, these uh, uh, charts and so on you should always decide whether the figure is appropriate for a given data. About methods, it's of course uh, being uh, as informative as possible. So giving all the details, the basic idea is, is that you should be able to repeat uh, what other researchers have done. Uh, so if some other researchers would try to replicate the study, they should be able to do this based on what has been presented in the methods. This is sometimes very hard for us to be such, to, to be so precise to, uh, to present all the details. And when it comes to introduction, this basic idea, the, the, this typical introduction is this funnel approach. So uh, starting from the broad general description of your research field, but of, of course, taking up the, the, the theme you are you are struggling with, and then moving on to detailed information about what is being uh, what is missing in research, uh, what is missing in this, uh, what is the niche you are filling, what is your research question, and so on. And discussion is of course uh, like um, 
discussing the results, right? So this, this typical discussion is just interpreting, comparing to other research, um, indicating limitations of your research, discuss it in various ways. So be attentive to various ways of, of writing this part because um, there are lots of, of, of possible, pos there are lots of possibilities here. And basically it applies to all of these parts because results, methods, introduction, discussion, we may, we may talk about some general rules, but of course, if you read papers, you see some differences, you see some, you see different approaches. These are mm, because people do lots of different research. Uh, so they may try to, to, to modify, and it's nothing wrong with this. It's perfectly fine um, un, uh, unless the paper gets messy, not clear, unstructured, the things I have said before. Uh, so I'm assuming that you are you are successful in impressing the editor. So you have convinced the editor that the paper should be reviewed and uh, in top tier journals, Q1, maybe Q2 also, it's almost never the case that you are being published straight away. So accept it without any comments. There are always comments. And usually these are major comments, major remarks, major revision, sometimes minor revision if your paper was really um, impressive. So uh, in increasing your chances is also appropriately responding to comments. And the main rules here are indicate the main changes, indicate the main changes by referring to reviewers' comments separately. A good editor will always give you this information. If you are an editor of a journal, you I think it's it's a good practice. It's it's, it's a good way to also mm, guarantee the quality of your journal to indicate how the authors should approach responding to comments. And one of the information the editors should give you is that you should indicate all the main changes by referring to reviewers' comments separately. Sometimes you have this space in the system, you can use the panel. Sometimes you just have to write a letter, write the responses uh, in an editor, using the editor, right? Uh, also, you can make generalizations for minor revisions. And uh, I will give you some examples in a second. I think that you should also be aware that the reviewing process in a high quality journals is about discussing. So the, the good editor, a good editor is not your enemy. Like the goal of a good editor is not to uh, reject you. If the editor has decided that the paper is being reviewed, that he really wants this paper to be published. So if you somehow defend yourself, point out reviewers discrepancies or defend your work in any other way, uh, by, for, for example, arguing or, uh, of course, using this very uh, uh, refi very refined and, and very nuanced uh, arguments, right? On, on, um, and, or just introducing some references. If you are defending your work, I think uh, it, it's, it's a good way to approach uh, responding to comments. Uh, so clearly indicate the, the changes, the main changes is about uh, mm, uh, being as precise as possible. So a good way to approach this is to basically um, pinpoint which reviewer you are ref uh, you are referring to. I will not maybe read uh, these this parts of, of some responses, just give you some basic idea. So uh, indicate which reviewer you are responding to, and of course, maybe copy paste the uh, exact comment and then just answer or comment or just basically respond. Uh, you can generalize minor revisions. I have mentioned this before, and I mean here some minor revisions like this 
uh, for example, language issues. So for example, comment seven uh, made by reviewer one, the language has been corrected so as not to seem one-sided and to avoid making implicit assumptions about the right state of affairs. So it's basically uh, for all these revisions that are too hard to pinpoint exactly in the paper, right? You would have to just, you know, point to all the pages and all the lines that you have corrected the language. This would be pointless. Uh, defending yourself is, is always a good idea. For example, one of the uh, one of the examples I have here is responding to some review one. Um, and the, this reviewer stated that conclusion of a paper of a of the article is not new or surprising, and this is uh, really harsh because usually this is about good quality research. That something is new, surprising, innovative. Well, despite this remark, the editor decided to publish this paper because the authors defended themselves. They stated these two points are rather difficult to address, given their vagueness and no references to any published sources, not new. We are not aware of any previous demonstrations of similar research. So <laughs> a mistake made by a reviewer was that if something is not new or surprising, the reviewer should point out the literature uh, describing this uh, phenomena, this research, and so on. Another example of defending um, oneself, uh, this is actually one of my uh, letters, one of my responses. Dear editor, I am sending the revised article. Please note that the review is generally very positive. We have carefully considered and followed the referee's advice. However, one issue has been resolved in a way different than suggested. We do not consider splitting the results and presenting them only partially to be a reasonable solution. We explain the reasons for our decision in our responses to the referee's comments. Uh, if I remember correctly, this was really, really interesting case for me because, yeah, the generally there were generally the, the reviews were were really positive, but one of the reviewers, yeah, he suggested that we should generally just split the paper to half and made some more re um, research, made some more interviews, surveys, and so on, and write the second part uh, anew. <laughs> so, but this was not, the problem is that this was not possible anymore because the project was just closed and uh, we did not have any access to the respondents, uh, to the interviews, interviewees, and so on. So basically it was not possible. So we decided we must do any, uh, everything to defend ourselves and to argue with this. And fortunately for us, it was a success. The editor approved. Of course, responding to comments is being extremely precise, not only when it comes to uh, writing these responses, but also, and a good editor will also, I think, emphasize this, that you should be as clear uh, as possible, as precise as possible, when uh, mm, highlighting or, or just marking your revisions. So you can use the track mode, uh, track changes mode. Uh, you can use some highlighting. You can use some comments, but remember about uh, anonymizing the comments. So please be uh, informative because the reviewers which are to decide the fate of the paper, it's not, it, there is nothing um, more irritating than just receiving a paper without the revisions being highlighted because of course, or marked because you have to read the paper again and you just forgot what was there before and you, you know what I mean. So the, my final maybe remarks, I am just, uh, I am concluding now. Uh, my final remarks relate to AI, generative AI. Uh, I've decided to include this in, in this workshop uh, to ask this question, uh, because of course the AI is uh, like a hype at the moment. So can generative AI help you? 
uh, especially if you are not a native English speaker, but because I will be discussing language issues as well. Sure, I think it can help you because, of course, lots of research are being done at the moment uh, that the not native English speakers are somehow, uh, well, they have a harder life when they decide to publish in top tier English language journals. Uh, some research shows that um, uh, when it comes to paper revisions, the frequency of language related revision is 12.5 higher. When it comes to writing, the non English um, speakers need 51% more time to write a paper. And when it comes to paper rejections, the frequency of language related rejections is 2.5 .5 times higher. And of course, AI can help you. I think AI can help you. It can augment your academic writing. So we can, for example, you can write, you can work with the language. But of course, AI will never, or at least not at the moment, when we are talking about what is the current state of AI. AI cannot replace original research ideas, or you AI will not write a good paper for you, like you know, write the whole paper. So you can use AI to generate some ideas, to polish the language, to uh, to somehow summarize, to trim uh, some parts of your uh, papers. Maybe just give you some ideas. You can use some prompts, prompts right to 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 generate some ideas. So you can use various types of tools. And I'm also uh, conducted workshop on these tools. I would suggest many. These are only some. Grammarly for language, paper pile for language, and some maybe trimming and generating ideas, SciSpace for uh, summarizing papers and also uh, language issues, Quillbot for language issues, Elicit for summarizing papers. But I would recommend using specialized academic tools and not general AI tools, like for example, ChatGPT or BART, Google BART, or some other, because Mm, these are not academic, these hallucinate, these are wrong, more general. I think it's it's better to use these specialized tools. But whenever you use uh, AI, especially for some uh, ID generation and, and uh, uh, just, you know, um, generating some, some text, some, some part of text, I think it's extremely important to be as transparent as possible because if the, the, the reviewers or the editors will detect AI usage, and there are lots of, of course, detectors. You can just put a, a piece of, of, of an article and just uh, use different tools to, to try to detect whether it was AI generated or not. And it's almost, well, you, you, you may have, Come to a conclusion that it's an AI. Basically, you can see. Sometimes you can see it's an AI. So it's not. It's it's basically it's it's uh, it's rejected. A straight away rejection. So if you have you have used some AI, I think it's extremely important to be transparent uh, and to declare this. So for example, you can declare this in a final moment, final paragraph, final part of a paper, some kind of declaration that you acknowledge the use of AI tools. Uh, and, and you can link to the tool to generate some part, what part, which prompt you have used, and how did you um, dealt with the output? Yeah? How did you use output? How did you modify the, the output? So I think this, this acknowledging AI use, if you use AI in any way, is extremely important uh, and this can only help you impress the editor because uh, it's being transparent. So uh, thank you very much for this workshop. Uh, it was a pleasure. And um, from, what I, from what I understand, there is a short Q&A session uh, uh, just now. But if you have any questions, you want to reach me out, please, by all means, please do. You can use my email. Uh, it's very easy, Piotr, and uh, you can see the uh, university domain. You can uh, search me on social media. I'm present on X, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Uh, you can, of course, visit my website. Mm, thank you very much uh, for, for this mm, workshop.
Yes, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh